Okay, so act two, scene one. And this is the long one. I mean, it's not substantially longer than the others. You know, you have to realize that Julius or that uh, Shakespeare, when he had those acts, they would constitute about twenty to thirty minutes of of stage time. If you didn't do that, then people just get bored, right? They just like, oh, this is going on too long. And so it's it's a strange thing to be a screenwriter because you have to think even more than a novel, even more than poetry. You have to think about how what your audience is feeling, right? Because if your audience isn't in it, then nobody's going to come see your play, right? Okay, so Act One, Act Two, Scene One. You've got we're at uh, Bruce's house. It's late night. He tells his slave boy Lucius to come bring a candle and to check the calendar to see if it's the um, eyes of Ides of March, right? And so Lucius does, and Brutus, he notices a couple things. He says that these notes are convincing him uh, to join the conspiracy. In other words, you know, Cassius has been getting his buddies, like Cask and Cinna, to throw notes in his window representing ordinary Roman citizens saying you need to do something, you need to do something, you need to strike. And so this influences Brutus. So after this happens, then the conspirators arrive. And several things happen. So he greets them, of course, and then they all uh, put hands together. Uh, promising that they will do it. They will act. Okay? So they promise that they will act, and uh, Cassius says they should swear an oath, which was a big deal back in the day. Like, you know, if you swore an oath, that meant it had come hell or high water, you are not going to betray that oath. That meant that you like you literally put your life on it. Now people say like, yeah, I swear I'll do it, and it's like, yeah, whatever, you know. Yeah, people. Really I'm, I swear, I swear, I'll I'll mow the lawn tomorrow, and then Dad's like, mm -hmm. you know. So, it. Yeah, but swearing an oath was a big thing back then, and so Brutus says, well, we're Roman, we're so noble that we don't even have to swear an oath. All we have to do is just say we're going to do it, and we'll do it. Then Brutus makes one of his dumb decisions. And Cassius, this happens constantly, Cassius says, let's, let's kill Mark Anthony. Okay, which is a very intelligent choice because Mark Anthony is a very strong man. He's Caesar's number one, or number two. Okay, and invariably, like when Caesar's dead, Mark Anthony is going to want revenge. And you're going to see Mark Anthony's speech in Act 3. He, he says some very, very dramatic things about murdering everybody. Okay? And his rage is absolutely uncontrollable. So Cassius is very right when he says this. And Brutus blows him off and says, No, no, it's too much. Okay? And if, if they had followed Cassius' plan, a Julius Caesar would only be three acts long. Okay? Because Mark Anthony would have been able to do nothing. <clears throat> and then um, what else happens? So finally, they leave, and Portia comes in. And Portia wonders what's happening. Again, Portia is Cassius's sister. Um, both of Ca both Cassius and, and Portia are son and daughter of Cato the Elder, who was almost as 
recognizes Julius Caesar. Okay, a very, very important figure in ancient Rome. And she chides him. She says, like, I'm not just some prostitute that comes to your bed whenever you want. You know, I'm equal with you in marriage, which is kind of a revolutionary thing to say because she is a very noble woman. And she says to him, please tell me what you're thinking. And he goes, okay, I'll tell you what. Go back to bed, and I'm going to come and tell you everything. Okay? And then finally, um, Artemid was it Artemidorus? I can't remember. At the end, you have a fellow come. I'm going to just say it's Artemidorus. Who urges, urges uh, Brutus, and they kind of talk to each other in secret language. And they say, like, hey, are you going to do something that will make, the, you know, he has a cold at the time. And he says, well, are you going to do something that makes uh, my sickness go away? And Brutus says, oh, yeah, I will. And then Artemidor says, and by, you know, by doing so, we've got to make a healthy man sick. So in other words, we've got to kill Caesar. And so they leave. Scene two ends. So scene three, or scene two, excuse me. Um, is the legendary scene of Julius Caesar's statue. So Calpurnia has just woken up. She screamed at her husband, as most women do. And she said, I saw this dream of you. You were a statue in the square. And you had been stabbed in multiple places. And blood was running onto the ground and pooling up about around your feet. And people were coming and gathering drink, like drinks or um, elixirs of your blood. And Calpurnia is absolutely terrified about it. She says, don't go to the Senate today. Something bad is about to happen. Then also there was a report that the augurs, uh, who would dissect birds, they would dissect birds. This is my chief thing of... Uh, they dissect birds, and they would open up the organs, and they'd see what the organs look like, and then they'd make predictions about the day. Well, the augurers found that there was no heart in the bird that they had opened. They couldn't find a heart inside. So it's another very, very bad omen. And so Caesar says, at first, he, gets, he is convinced. not to go to the Senate. Okay? But then Decimus comes in and or Decius? Decius. Decius comes in and he's and he had previously been part of the conspirators. And he had said, Don't worry, I can flatter this guy out and about. I'll make him leave his house and come to the Senate. So Decius takes this, after hearing this, he takes this kind of metaphorical dream that Calpurnia has. And he says, oh, this is the most positive thing you could ever hear. In fact, it's, it's a very good thing. Because look, all of these people are receiving this like reinvigorating blood from uh, you know, how wonderful of a, a leader you are. right? And so by flattering him, Caesar decides to go to the Senate. Right. Then we've got two very short scenes. Act, I'm sorry, scene three, which um, I think it's Trebonius. He's um, he's just a random guy, and he has this idea that there's something that's going to go down, and so it's just him talking to himself, writing a letter saying, "I'm going to go tell Caesar. You know, he better be careful." It's very very short. And then scene four is Portia. Of course, Portia was not able to see. Portia was not able to get any resolution from what Brutus was doing. She didn't know what Brutus had done in act or in scene one, right? And so, because of that, she sends Lucius to the marketplace, but she doesn't really tell him what to do. And so they both kind of get frustrated at each other because Lucius doesn't know what to look for or what to do, and Portia doesn't know what to tell him because she, does, she never got an answer for, from scene one, 
right? And so with that in mind, uh, the soothsayer comes in and says, and so she asks him, like, what do you think is going to happen? And he says, well, I'm going to go to Caesar, and I'm going to tell Caesar to make friends with himself by getting rid of his other friends. In other words, you know, cast off the people around you, and you will be saved. And which further uh, frustrates Portia. And at the end of Act 2, she ends up running out of her house towards the Senate to see what's going to happen. Okay, so that's the Act 2, scene 1, 2, 3, and 4. Thank you.